Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guests today are Laura Cunningham and Kevin Emmerich. She's an artist, naturalist, author, and biologist. He's a biologist and former National Park Ranger. They co-founded a conservation organization, Basin Range Watch, that works toward preserving the last non-destroyed regions of California and Nevada deserts. So first off, thank you for your work in the world, and second, thank you for being in the program. Well, thank you, and um, it's always an honor to get on to your program here because um, you've written so many good things about the environment. Well, thank you. And before we start, um, Laura, will you give a brief plug for your, your excellent book about uh, um, California as it was before uh, before it started getting hammered? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I wrote a an ecological history of California wildlife and landscapes called A State of Change, Forgotten Landscapes of California in 2010, and it's now out of print. It just went out of print this year, the second edition, and there are no plans to republish it, but I will be uploading it onto a free distance learning curriculum this year, so stay tuned for a website that has the manuscript. Well, we've already done one interview on it, but maybe when you get it up, we can do another. That would be great. Yeah, because I think it's, A, I think it's an incredibly important book, and B, I wish that there were books like this for every biome that that uh, showed what the biome was like and what it's like now. I, that, that I, I don't think... I don't think it is possible to overestimate the importance of such studies. Well, and thank you. And the good thing about digitizing the book on a website is I can put my desert chapters back in. They were edited out because the book was too long. Um, you know, I, I'm sorry, but you just said blasphemy. There is no such thing as a book that's too long. <laughs> I agree. Uh, okay. So the, the, the point of the interview today is we're going to talk about some very destructive industrial projects going in uh, in the desert or proposed for the desert. And this comes from an email exchange that Kevin and I had a few months ago where he said, quote, at this point, Gemini Solar is being built on 11 square miles of habitat for desert tortoise. Yellow Pine Solar will be built on five square miles. And there's now one proposed called Battleborn Solar, which will be built on 14 square miles of habitat. So first, can you talk about the what? How many how many solar facilities are in the regional desert there that you know of? How much habitat has already been destroyed? And then talk about these three projects. Well, that's a good question about how many facilities. Um, the number has really grown exponentially over um, the years, um, and it's starting to get a resurge. Um, I came up with, I got to ask this before, and we have about 70,000 acres of tortoise habitat in California that's probably been developed just for solar facilities alone. And, you know, that's just the state of California. Um, here in Nevada, we're getting um, more in the proposal stage for the, the solar project. But I would still say that um, about maybe 15 to 20 square miles of that habitat has been developed already. And um, the proposed um, outlook for the future, um, we're probably looking at uh, another 100 square miles or so of Mojave Desert habitat, and much of it would overlap, you know, with the desert tortoise and other species. Um, I will give a brief overview of these three projects. Lori, feel free to jump in um, and just, just to tell you what's going on and what their status is. So the first one that we talked about was Gemini Solar, and this one had a really big political backing to it. We mentioned, talked before about um, the state of Nevada um, passed a, a law, basically, that requires utilities now to obtain 50% of their energy from renewable sources. And that law, incidentally, was 
passed by a state senator who came right out of the hard-scale solar industry. On his own time, this man happens to own part of the Gemini solar project, and um, that happened to be one of the first projects that got a contract with one of the major Nevada utilities, NV Energy, that's required to buy all this renewable energy. Gemini Solar will be 7,100 acres. Um, that's 11 square miles. And um, it happens to be in an area in southern Nevada that's um, popular on a recreational basis. It's near Nevada's first state park. It's called Valley of Fire State Park, and it highlights sandstone formations and really beautiful geologic formations. It's near wilderness areas, but it also happens to be a really good habitat. All of this is on publicly owned land, federal land owned by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, the habitat is um, one of the better areas left for the desert tortoise um, to threaten species, and it's seeing a decline throughout most of its recovery unit. It's protected by the Endangered Species Act. So it's ironic that the Bureau of Land Management was so quick to approve such a large project. The biologists they hired for the project estimate that 1,200 desert tortoises will have to be excavated and moved. However, they'll probably only move about 200 or so because it's very difficult to find juvenile and hatchling desert tortoises. And so many of those will probably be killed in the construction. Um, the area is also habitat for some very rare plants. Um, one plant considered one of Nevada's most endangered plants called the Three Corner Milk Betch will lose 700 acres permanently. And that's a lot of acres when you're talking about a small, rare annual plant that only grows in certain areas. Um, Gemini Solar will impact um, archaeology sites. Um, the old Spanish National Historic Trail is used historically, but it also is predated and was used by Native Americans. It's going to obliterate about three square miles of that. Um, or to three miles of the trail, not square miles. Um, the project itself is probably, we think it started construction. It got delayed a little bit from the last time that we had that email exchange, but we believe it is starting construction right now. And um, we're not really sure, you know, when it will be finished, but what they're planning on doing is um, removing all of the tortoises they can find and then taking about two-thirds of this project, or 4,600 4, acres, and mowing down the vegetation. And they're just going to grind it down to the roots and allow it to grow back, um, I'll place the solar panels over it, and then release the tortoises back under the panels. It's never been tried before. Um, we've identified several problems with it, but they're going to go full speed ahead on this. And we're... Not very happy about that, obviously. Um, the second one I'll talk about is the Yellow Pine Solar Project. Wait, before this be, is also. Be, before, oh, go ahead. Before you do that, can you can you say what the problems are with doing that? Okay. Well, Gloria, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, classically, these solar projects have just gotten heavy machinery, bulldozers, scraper graders, blades, and just removed the desert, the creosote, the Mojave Yuccas completely, which to us was horrifying. I mean, this is old-growth desert. It would be like clear-cutting a redwood forest, in our opinion. So and wait, wait, after wait, we've been complaining... Wait, wait, before you go on, can you... Aren't creosote bushes, aren't they really, really... I mean, you just said old-growth, but don't creosote bushes live a long time? Yes, yeah, sometimes if the soil is not disturbed... Um, on very stable surfaces, they have found clonal rings of creosote that they estimate are 11,000 years old, this clonal ring that keeps expanding outward. I mean, just amazing to think how old some of these shrubs can be. So, so basically us, they, like, I was just going to say, basically they would talk about redwoods as just young pups. 
your little kids. Right. Anyway. And this is not to mention all the diversity of other old shrubs, like there's Mormon tea and rabbit brush is a pioneer shrub, but there are cat claw acacias on the site, barrel cacti. So quite a lot of uh, diverse plants. There's biological soil crust, which has fungal mycelia going deep into the soil that sequesters carbon. And who knows how old a formation that that is? Probably, again, thousands of years old. These deep biological living soil crusts with moss, fungi, other like liverworts. So, obviously, it was bad to just come and grade these things flat and just release carbon and kill lizards and destroy tortoise habitat. So the developers recently have kind of upped the ante and say, well. We'll not just blade everything flat and grade it. We'll mow everything down to 18 inches, put the solar panels over that, still needing heavy construction machinery, and then we'll um, just trim the vegetation so that it doesn't grow up into the solar panels because obviously that could be a fire risk. So this is highly problematic to us because... A, you're already very much disturbing these biological soil crusts and delicate, like, rock formations called desert pavement that are ancient. When you come and drive over to deliver um, your pallets full of panels and your construction machinery, they actually have to have these little post hole. They're not drillers. They pound in the posts that hold the photovoltaic panels. So they're like pounding machines. And we've seen dozens of them out there, and they just pound these posts into the ground. Now think of the the disturbance that causes to burrowing animals, such as Gila monsters and tortoises and kangaroo rats. They're probably running over and crushing burrowing animals in their burrows. They're, of the soil surface disturbance will bring in invasive plants such as Sahara mustard and red brome, which is just completely upending this old growth desert and disturbing it and making a weed field. And then they'll propose to come back and redisturb it as they trim, and they'll probably apply um, herbicides to try to keep down the invasive plants, which are a fire hazard in a solar field. So, I mean, those are just some of the things that we think are an outrageous mitigation, quote, unquote, that they think is a better option to building a, a utility-scale solar project on a pristine desert habitat. Oh, and one other thing is the mowing machines that we use, they're called heavy-duty mulchers. They weigh 23,000 pounds. And so we don't see that as a light impact on the desert. Right. It's not just they come with clippers or a lawnmower. It's a heavy-duty machine that masticates yuccas and cat claw acacias and everything else down to a foot or two. So I just want to point out that uh, that there are creosote bushes who have lived for more than 10,000 years until they encountered modern, quote, environmentalists, end quote. That's not- yeah, that's the trouble with... Um, Having a climate change policy where it's all of the above, and after 10 years of this all of the above strategy where we don't consider, you know, other avenues to living with the world, such as just not disturbing large tracts of natural habitat, trying to have some energy efficiency, energy conservation, maybe lessening human population. But, yeah, I disagree with a lot of modern environmentalism on this. So... So thank you so much for that. Can you can you go on to the second uh, harvesting facility? Yes. This one is called Yellow Pine Solar, um, and it's located northwest of Gemini. Um, and it's on also all federal land owned by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, Yellow Pine is named after an old mine up in the nearby mountain range near it. Um, this would be on 3,000 acres. 
Um, that comes to just under five square miles. That's about four and a half or so square miles. Um, and it would be located on another very significant desert habitat, slightly different than Gemini. It's more dominated by very old um, geologic surface structure, desert pavements. Um, but it also is unique to Gemini in that it has more um, desert vegetation that's larger like Mojave yuccas. Um, and the Mojave yucca is an interesting plant. It's a tree yucca, um, and it, it's related to the Joshua tree, which is now making a lot of news because there are efforts to list the Joshua tree as endangered in the state of California, and that's over things like climate change and overdevelopment. But a lot of the people don't really um, give this particular plant um, the same attention. Mojave yuccas can live to be five to 600 years old. And um, the Bureau of Land Management estimated that there are approximately nine, uh, 93,000 of these plants on this site. That's a lot of plants. Um, the configuration of the project will allow some of the desert washes to remain undeveloped. And so we believe that um, 85,000 of those Mojave yuccas will be removed from the site. And they're doing the same thing that they're doing on Gemini solar. And they're going to mow down the vegetation. We asked why don't you transplant the Mojave yuccas? And the, the BLM, that's the Bureau of Land Management, comes back and says that's just too many. It would be too much work and too expensive for the solar company. So what they do is they put this money into a mitigation fund that, that takes care of some future environmental you know, good deed, and that's supposed to make up for it, and that's supposed to compensate for the destruction of these plants, and they will shred them down to the roots and everything else that's associated with them. Um, there are lizards called desert night lizards that live in the branches. There are birds that nest in the yuccas. The yellow pine site also has um, a significant desert tortoise population, um, and it's unfortunate that population was hit by a really big drought in 2014, from 2010 to 2014, and experienced some die-off. But even though it's been a really hot summer, we've had a few really good wet winters in the last five years, and those tortoises have started to rebound. And what a terrible thing to do when you've got this threatened species that's on a rebound in an area to just take it away and just remove the habitat and just put solar panels that could easily go somewhere else. Um, yellow pine solar is also located in a very undeveloped part of the Mojave Desert in southern Nevada, and there's not too many of those left. That's all getting developed and eaten up with urbanization, and um, it will be um, a large tragedy. It'll be really visible from several wilderness areas, and so it was one that we opposed. Gemini has been approved. Um, the BLM signed a record of decision and gave them permission. Yellow Pine is in a um, review stage now, and um, we expect it to be approved. It's fast-tracked by the Trump administration, and we expect that approval to be in the next couple months for that one. Um, I can talk about the third one, unless you've got some questions, or does Laura, do you have something to add to that yeah, I could just add about um, all three of these projects, the Battleborn, Yellow Pine, and Gemini, are in excellent desert tortoise habitat. And it seems like environmentalists are now throwing the tortoise under the bus in the name of climate change, which is very misguided to me. So all, all of these areas, I used to work as a, a tortoise mitigation biologist like 15 years ago, and it, it's actually one reason I co-founded Basin and Range Watch with Kevin is I just couldn't see doing this the rest of my life. I mean, you literally have a an army of so-called biologists. We called them biostitutes, actually, <laughs> where we had shovels. That was our main tool of the trade, shovels. And you spend 10 to 12 hours a day, seven days a week, for months on end, 
crisscrossing the solar project before it gets bladed, and you just dig up every burrow you see, every kangaroo, rat burrow, badger, coyote, kit fox, tortoise, dig it all the way out, Some somewhere like 12, 15 feet down, um, complex burrows. You remove all the tortoises very carefully. You need a permit to do this, an authorized biologist permit with Fish and Wildlife Service, and they're translocated to a recipient site somewhere else. And then we built little tortoise exclusion fences out of hardware cloth all around the 3,000-acre project. And once we were finished, you know, thrashing this habitat with our shovels, then the heavy machinery could safely go in and not take a tortoise or harm a tortoise, supposedly. But what we found in a project around 2005 in the Mojave Desert was tortoises like their home ranges. They have their own burrows. They have several burrows that they use for getting away from the summer heat in the middle of the day, hibernating in in the winter. They have little scrapes that they dig to catch rainwater. And they have very good memories. They know where all of these things are. So when you take a tortoise out of its burrow, yanking it out of its home, put it in a cardboard box, drive it 20 miles away, and then dump it, that's what we used to do, into a new area. Now it's a little more careful. You know, we make sure they have a burrow, an artificial burrow. But there's competition with other tortoises. And the translocated tortoises remember their home, and many of them actually try to go back. And we had one male tortoise that made a beeline, straight line, in two weeks, traveled 20 miles. Imagine that, a tortoise, 20 miles in two weeks, to get back to the area we had dug it out of, and it hit the exclusion fence and just paced back and forth, back and forth. And we knew this because we had glued a little satellite radio transmitter to its shell, so we were able to go rescue the tortoise, but others haven't been so lucky, and before the biologists could go find them, they died pacing the fence, overheating, trying to get back to their home burrows. So there's a – thank you for those. And there's a, a couple things I was thinking. One is when you were saying that they, um, they were going to uh, – that they're going to put in money into a mitigation fund for having destroyed, killed all these plants and animals. That's always made me think of, I got a deal. So, Kevin and Laura, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill you and take your home, and then <laughs> I'm going to put put some money into a fund that at some point um, I will use to help somebody else. Does that sound like a fine deal to you? Um, yeah, that, that sounds about summing it up. That sums it up pretty well. We just discovered something um, this past week that is just like that um, for Gemini Solar Project. We found out that that old Spanish trail, historic trail, you can actually go out there and see wagon ruts still ancient in the dirt. And I'm sure this was an old Native American trade route that the – explorers and settlers followed so it has a deeper history than just the spanish um time unique irreplaceable well the solar developer for gemini is going to give two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the organization that is sort of the friends group that the old spanish trail association they're supposed to take care of this trail map it interpret it they're taking $250,000 from the solar company and agreeing to the solar project, and they will get a parking lot with an interpretive kiosk as mitigation. We were appalled. Yeah, that's that's pretty much classic pave over paradise and put up a parking lot. Exactly. Um, yeah, and- there's a, a thought that education and um signed with pretty pictures will make up for those kinds of destruction. They, they consider that just as valuable. Yeah. Well, but I had another example I was going to use, but before that, I just want to go back to what you said about wagon ruts. And I grew up in Colorado, and sometimes we would go way up into the alpine tundra. And 
um, you could see like tire tracks from decades before, and you could see um, you could see the effects of of um, of of wagons from back in the day in the days of the um, Colorado Gold Rush, and the point is that if we can see wagon trails from what four to five hundred years ago, three to four hundred years ago, that's that that talks about how incredibly delicate and slow growing those soil structures are. Yes, that's a good point. When we scrape everything and mow it, drive heavy truck machinery over it, it'll be centuries before we get that pristine, beautiful desert back. Some of those biological soil crusts take they can it, they take almost like a century just to grow just over a centimeter. And so that's, you know, how slow the recovery is. So the other thing I was going to mention about about moving tortoises or moving the yucca, for that matter, is um, here's another great idea. Why don't I, um, because I want your house for uh, I don't know a football stadium or or something. Um, why don't I go and kidnap you and take you and drop you? in the middle of some other community where somebody else already lives and people already have their homes and I will just drop you off there. Oh, and I'll make you a little itty bitty shelter. I'll make you like a, a, a shed that you can go in um, to get out of the, to get out of the cold and heat. Um, does that sound like a fine deal? Are you going to agree to that? <laughs> yeah, no, I wouldn't. And it, it's, you bring up another good point. It's like imminent domaining desert life but they don't even get fair market value for their homes and boroughs. And to me, it's almost, it verges on a way of thinking that environmentalists can just go into a place and help developers, you know, just destroy it for some industrial, for-profit, commercial, capitalist venture, and the mitigation is fake. The pub, general public doesn't really get to have a say in this. So to me, it's it's no worse than the pioneer settlers coming and taking Indian land. There's some science to back up what you're saying for the tortoise. The recent study and it showed that um, desert tortoise males that are moved into a a different range are, are rejected by the females that are in the recipient population, and they don't breed as much. And so the viability of of the species goes down right there because, you know, they're not able to lay eggs. And and so that's kind of backing up that, well, we're just throwing a animal in somebody else's home and, and the recipient animals don't like that. So well, interesting. So could you talk about the third project? Yes, it's called, this is um, in a stage of just planning, but it's a concern because the same company that built Gemini wants to build this one. It's called the Battle Born Solar Project, and that's named after Nevada's state logo. And um, these companies, they just make them bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, they're getting the attention of all the utilities because they have this philosophy that um, in order to prevent the solar projects from overloading the grid, we're going to make every new project have a big element of battery storage. So every site, no matter how hot it is out there, is going to have a huge battery bank of lithium-ion batteries. And um, the idea is the more of these we have, the more energy we can store. And so the builders of these projects just have great plans to not only build this one, but many more. But Battleborn is a record breaker because they're proposing to build this on 9,000 acres or 9,100 acres or 14 square miles of public land. And this would be located about 20 to 25 miles northeast of the Gemini Solar Project 
on a fairly unique and well-known um, local area called the Mormon Mesa. Um, it's just this elevated flat mesa, um, and it's between two um, desert rivers, the Muddy River and the Virgin River. Um, and so this project would be all solar panels with, with huge battery banks, but it also happens to be on another area that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has identified as essential and important for the desert tortoise in terms of its connectivity or linkage. In other words, like the slow migration of different populations through an area. Um, so they, it's the same company as Gemini, so they intend to mow down the vegetation and try to allow the tortoises to be re-released into this area. Um, and what worries us about this is that the company is in really close association with the Nevada governor. And the Nevada governor um, sent in an official letter to the Trump administration to fast-track this project. And that's kind of how it works when um, the administration sees that a local government wants a project fast track. That means that they get what they want. And so we're really worried about this one also because the Trump administration um, has just really gutted the National Environmental Policy Act. And um, those changes take effect, I think, in two weeks. And after that happens, um, we're hearing that it's possible that large development projects of, of many kinds will just be getting approved without our ability to even have a public comment period or involvement. And because this particular project is on the radar of the Trump administration, um, we're worried that the worst scenario is going to happen and we're going to just lose that without even having a chance to fight it. And so um, there's a whole other, you know, list of solar projects just in the state of Nevada that are being proposed. In that particular area, there's several of them that are now either approved or have been built on the Moapa Indian Reservation, approximately 20,000 acres worth. But there's also a lot of permits on uh, adjacent federal lands in the state to just develop bigger and bigger projects like this. And um, we are worried that the, if we do get the new administration, they're really going to pump a lot of money into green energy. And um, it's almost like the two administrations are working together on this because the Trump administration is really weakening a lot of the environmental laws, and we think the potential Biden administration will pump a lot of federal money. I mean, they talked about putting $2 trillion into a Green New Deal, and he's already promised, I think, about 70 or $80 billion for large-scale renewable energy projects. So... We have a, a lot to think about, and the future doesn't look that promising in terms of, you know, the larger politicians really listening to us. But battle-born solar could be the next really big project, and it might be revolutionary in terms of federal permitting, and we're pretty concerned. But let me talk really quickly, though, about how I think it's impossible to get to 100% renewable energy on the national grid because of the, you know, inconvenient details of the technology that we're putting out in these hot deserts. The, I talked to a Nextera energy developer about those battery banks because this is what the solar industry is relying on now. We're going to have lithium-ion batteries connected to our solar field, and then we'll be able to store you know, a little bit of energy maybe three to four hours after the sun sets, which is the new peak for usage, is not in the middle of the day when the solar projects are pumping out electricity. It's more like 6 to 8 to 9 p.m. is when people are really coming home and shutting their or t turning on their AC and television, and that all gets strained even more when you have 
a heat wave like we just did. So this developer said, well, yeah, there, it's, it's 112 out there in the desert, the Mojave Desert up in Gemini or other places, yellow pine. So we have to cool the lithium-ion batteries in these big kind of metal container buildings out there in the desert. They have to be operating at a very small temperature um, threshold. They can't get too cold or they can't get too hot. If they overheat, they degrade or apparently even explode. So they will have, there's a couple of ways to cool the lithium battery banks. Is One technology is to immerse them into a box full of coolant fluid. And the other, which I think Jim and I may be using, is you actually put air conditioners on the buildings that house the batteries. And that's what we call a kind of a parasitic load. You're actually using some of the electricity from the solar project just to cool the solar project before it even goes on the grid. So there's just a lot of technical difficulties, I think, to making ourselves completely 100% renewable energy, but that doesn't get talked about very much. Or you get called a climate denier if you even bring this up. Well, it's, it's, I'm sorry that you even have to mention that because the notion of 100% renewable energy, this is why you know I've got a book coming out next March called Bright Green Lies that just shows how incredibly um, fantastical all this is. It's, it's nothing but a fantasy. It's a very destructive fantasy. There's... On, on so many levels, this is just so crazy, whether it's um, the fact that electricity only accounts for 20% of total energy use. So, I mean, there's no way they're going to replace semis with um, with electric-run semis uh, because right. en- the energy density of diesel is so much higher than it is for batteries. And let's talk about the destructiveness of the batteries. Let's talk about the destructiveness of mining for the batteries. Let's talk about the destructiveness of the mining for the photovoltaic cells. And then, of course, there's the harvesting facilities. It's, the whole thing just makes me really angry that you or any of us have to spend time telling people that it's not possible. That, I mean, the energy return on energy invested for oil is so high that it's functionally irreplaceable. And, and that's not even to talk about the fact, why do we want all this energy anyway um, for more server farms, for more marijuana grows, for more all sorts of other stuff in when it's costing the planet. That's not some sort of dilemma. That's just more more colonialism, more um, destroying the planet to continue the economy. Sorry that my voice is getting thin and reedy. That just makes me really mad. No, I agree. Fully agree on that. So when gonna- the lithium mining... Too, the, is, I know you were talking recently about the Rhyolite Ridge mine, but there's a lot of demand for that. And the amount of destruction and water it takes to do that, just to back up the so-called green industry, is, is hypocritical, to say the least. So, so I want to I back up a second and just point out two things, um, or one thing that's two things, which is that you... we. We, you talked about Trump gutting NEPA, and I mean I can't stand Trump either. And Trump is very easy to to despise, and but I also think it's really important to point out that what you said about I mean it's good cop bad cop because he's doing the heavy lifting for that. And if there's a Biden, well what I want to say is that Chris Brooks, whom you mentioned earlier, uh, is a Democrat, and the governor of Nevada is a Democrat, so. Neither neither party is a friend of tortoises or creosote bushes. That's all I wanted to say. I agree. Uh, and um, the governor of Nevada has a long history as a Clark County commissioner taking money from housing development and um, got himself in a little hot water over um, supporting a development not far from one of their beloved, you know, natural park areas. So it, it's really true that i mean these are developers and they want growth they don't really want to protect the environment so you there's something you've said several times that i want to sort of highlight um you said that these are on public lands and 
can you talk about the fact that those are public lands? And here's a question I have no idea the answer to. Um, I know that when they do timber sales on federal lands or on public lands, those lose money. They're giveaways. When they put ski resorts on public lands, those are giveaways. When they put mines on public lands, they're giveaways. Uh, when they do grazing on public lands, it's, it's below market value. So a couple questions. Can you talk about the fact that this is your land and my land as well as the desert tortoise's land? And can you also – I don't know the answer. Is – are, are the, is the American public getting fair market value for the, the basically destruction of these lands, ignoring the fact that fair market value doesn't help the tortoises? Well, I'll cover the public lands part, or what are public lands. I mean, they're basically our federal lands. And BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, acquired quite a number of acres, millions and millions of acres, and just you know, when this became a country, and it was really land that nobody wanted. But over the years, I mean, the West got developed and public lands became more cherished than ever. I think in Nevada, um, there's kind of a attitude that public lands are just too much of it. In fact, it's, it's declared 87% federally owned. And so there's an attitude by a lot of government officials that it really needs to be mined and developed and grazed. And now solar energy is really the latest, um, I think, scam to take lands away. But over the years, I mean, as the southwest cities boomed in population and got bigger, public lands became more cherished. And we're talking about three solar projects that are in the southern state of Nevada, which it's still it has federal it has a lot of federal land but it's just booming in in growth. The COVID-19 crisis did slow it down to a bit, but it's still like bursting at the seams. And a lot of the people that live there now really value the public lands, and we all own them. I mean, as Americans, that's that's just how it works. And so when it, a lot of them are managed under a um, philosophy called multiple use and that essentially means that you know a lot of you it's supposed to be for everything it's supposed to be for some mining for some recreation for probably a, and for energy development you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but when you get into these gigantic solar projects um, they're taking up so many acres they literally take up entire basins when you, it, the, the whole area, our group's called Basin and Range Watch. It's named after basin and range topography, where there's a mountain range and a basin. And you fill these up with solar project. We find some, like the El Dorado Valley in Nevada, where there's really not as much basin left as there used to be. So are these really public land? I mean, um, they're giving away so many acres one single use for the solar industry. Yeah, I was just going to back what Kevin said that, I mean, by federal law, this is multiple use public land. And when you give one company, a developer, often from out of the country, 14 square miles, and then that developer puts a, a 10, 8 foot tall chain link fence around their solar project with barbed wire, razor wire on top no trespassing signs. That's virtually privatizing large areas of public land where we, the people, can no longer access for 30 years and, you know, they're supposed to clean up and remediate the land after they take their solar project away in 30 years. It'll be trashed. So this is really the virtual privatization of a lot of public land for energy sprawl. And if they were to purchase the same amount of acreage that is privately owned, it would really cost them a lot of money. So I think that answers partly your second question, you know, are we getting our monies where we're essentially giving it away to them. And um, the administration before Trump, the Obama administration, often would make them tax exempt as well. They'd get all kinds of tax credits and wouldn't really have to pay as much. 
and that was in an effort to encourage this development on public land. But um, we we find, I will say, that the public hates it. Um, there's a real divide between what you read from some of the larger mainstream environmental groups that some would support solar on public land, and then the comments and this, the, the citizens. The citizens hate it, and the other people are kind of making deals with it. But in my opinion, it's um, a real freebie to the solar industry to be able to develop on those public lands. They're often hit with mitigation costs. They do have to pay lease fees to the Bureau of Land Management every year, so um, they do have to pay something. But it's it's just a drop in the bucket to what they would have to pay in taxes or just for, for acreage of private land. So it's a big scam and giveaway in my view. So I, I, I'm focusing on two words that you said, 30 years and... I don't know if there's a word to describe both profound rage and sorrow because even if we ignore the desert tortoises and everything else, they are killing 10,000 and 11,000 year old creosote bushes for a project that's going to last 30 years. Uh, yeah. Words. Right. I mean, it's a cliche, but I mean that I'm I'm speechless at that. Yeah, the right of way permit that they get on public land is usually 30 years, and then the developer, I suppose, they could renew that, but they're supposed to take everything down and remediate the land, which is a joke to us. Well, there are old um, wind projects on some public land where they just haven't done that because the company goes bankrupt or sells the project or, or the utility cancels the purchase agreement or, or possibly there's a natural disaster that damaged their their turbines. But there are areas where there's still like old remnants of things that haven't really been taken down yet. Well, that's no different than in the old days. That's how they got some of the BLM lands was that um – a timber company would cut over the lands and then they would just stop paying taxes because it didn't, wasn't useful to them anymore. I mean, this is just the same story. Okay, so, so it I. Seems that way. Um, so we only have a couple minutes left and, um, I, I guess I want to ask two things. One of them is, um, how can people, three things. One is, how can people, what can people do to try to stop these juggernauts? Two, how can people support your work in specific? And three, what was the wonderful thing about both of you that caused both of you to get off your butts and actually do this so that somebody who is in some other place facing some other problem can get off their butts and do something instead of just going, oh, this is terrible? We could answer that one first. I mean, we... Um, saw about 10 to 11 years ago plans to cover our region that, where we live right now with solar projects and nobody else was really interested in helping us and so we just said well if anything's going to happen we have to do it ourselves and we can at least educate people on that and it turned out to work out for a lot of other people who were in the same boat. And so we we feel for those other folks who live in those areas or love those areas. And we definitely, you know, don't want to see the biological diversity and cultural history just given away for these short-term boondoggles. Um, oh. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of environmental organizations seem to like to look at maps and computer graphics and not really go outside and hike on natural deserts. So I think we were trying to fill a niche there of saying, you know, come out with us and let's go on a hike and look at all the tortoise burrows and the creosote rings and these beautiful Mojave yuccas that are potentially going to get destroyed. And so I think our approach is educational, grassroots, 
I mean, what you can do is go on to basinandrangewatch.org, sign up for our newsletter where we send out sample comment letters that you can send to BLM or your Congress people. You know, and if you're a member of another environmental group, feel free to contact them and say, why are you supporting destruction of desert tortoise habitat? I mean, if more people spoke up and got educated and then tried to sway the NGOs and the government and Congress, I mean, that would be a big help to us. And what, okay, I guess this is the last question, is how do you, um, how, what I'm always really interested in is how do people go from, oh gosh, this is terrible, to actually, actually, um, to doing something. And for me, part of it was that I met John Osborne, who was an environmentalist in Spokane, who was able to sort of channel my energy into a positive direction. And is there, what advice would you give to people who, who may have some local project? And it doesn't matter if it's a dam project in Alabama or, or a solar project in Nevada or California. What advice would you give to people who are just starting out, and it just seems like these problems are so overwhelming, I can't do anything, what advice would you give them to, to, to sort of take the first baby steps? Well, I would say network with one another, but um, definitely get involved in local government. Um, if there is a public meeting about a particular solar project, wherever it's located, attend it, make people know. And then um, write op-eds in newspapers and, um, you know, write letters to politicians. It sounds all standard, but the more um, attention that goes to these and the more blacklisted they become, um, and the earlier that you do that in the planning process, the more of a chance that you'll have to actually stop it. When they get later in the planning process, they're often in these stages of approval where you need attorneys and a lot of money to stop them. So my advice is to follow the news, but get vocal early and don't be intimidated. Um, just, just say what you feel, and if it, don't worry about if it's the wrong way to say it or not. Just say it. That's exactly what I was going to say, Kevin, is, is like, I mean, I... I guess Kevin and I have just always sort of been activists and we want to do something instead of sitting there and hoping someone else will do it. But don't be afraid to have some courage to just get out of the armchair, put your foot into the fray, and you can mess up. It's okay. I mean, when, when I first got into this, I was doing everything wrong. I didn't know what I was doing. But you stick with it and you gradually learn what's going on and how to be more effective and how to... Try to save the tortoise. You you learn it as you go. So just have some courage to just step in and get involved. That's all it takes. Well, thank you so much for all of that. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guests today have been Laura Cunningham and Kevin Emmerich. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.